Okay, let's talk about the difference between system efficiency and product efficiency. Is it possible, let's go back to the pump again, is it possible to take a very good pump and screw up its installation so bad that it doesn't work right? Yes, it is. We've seen it happen. Good example, single speed pump, boot in backwards. Will it work? Yeah, but not like it's supposed to, right? And the reason that I have a car graphic up here, one of the things that I want to describe to you is, is if I had a 90 mile per gallon carburetor, does that make that a very efficient car, fuel efficient car? Not if it has square tires. You have to look at the total system efficiency. One of the guys was talking about uh, ductwork leaking. I mean, we've, we've heard examples the last couple of days on why system efficiency is so important. Let's talk about resource efficiency. For you people that deal with Fortune 500 companies, these four resource efficiency mantra is exactly what they quote now. They beat them in the head. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and repair. It used to be just reduce, reuse, and recycle, but they've added repair to it. Now, what did that kick the door in for us? Service. So be aware of it. This is where they're coming from. Now, I don't recommend, for you that are trying to figure out what the heck these are, I don't recommend, as part of this resource efficiency, recycling coffee packs. You know, where you take them, you dry them out, and you reuse them. That's what those are, is they're coffee packs hung up on a clothesline. We get a little bizarre in some of our graphics. Let's talk about electrical real quick. Phantom load. If you have a cell phone, and we know everybody in this room has one, and you have a cell phone charger, and you take your cell phone off the charger, does the load drop off of that charger unit? No, it doesn't it will continue to use electricity. When Joe and I go out and we train people, we have a little toy that we take out and we actually show people, we put, a, put it on the, uh, a meter and we put on your cell phone with the charger and we show the load. And then we take the cell phone off and it continues to show a load, a draw of electricity. People are shocked. People are absolutely shocked that it still considers, continues to uh, draw a load. And there's all kinds of other examples of, of situations like that that will continue to draw a load. Uh, instant on TVs. I have one. That draws a load constantly. Transformers and heating systems, right? The 24-volt transformers. When you shut the, the furnace or the boiler off for the season, does it turn off that transformer? I'm going to tell you, I would say probably most times, no, it doesn't. So when during the off-season, does that 24-volt transformer continue to pull a draw? Yes, it does. So that's called phantom load. It's also called a ghost load. It's also called a standby load. It's called leaking electricity, wall warts, and vampire load. Okay. Transformers, net adapters, cell phone charger, instant on TVs, and cordless tool chargers all run up to your electricity. Now, does anybody have any idea on phantom load? If we were to, de to eliminate phantom load, we would decrease the electrical load 20%. 20% of your electric bill, statistically, is phantom load. <coughs> Scary. Okay, let's talk about air. The one message, if anything, that you take home and you take when you teach your, your, uh, the people that you train is the, the carbon monoxide. Remember we were talking about negative pressurization and combustion gases coming back into the mechanical room? I went to a training session with Bob Dwyer and Eric Rasmussen in, in Las Vegas a few years ago when they worked for Backrack, and they, I went through carbon monoxide certification training. I went home, I was scared to death. I immediately bought myself a personal carbon monoxide detector and started carrying it. This was when I was a consulting engineer in hydronics. Six 
out of the next 10 mechanical rooms I went into, my personal carbon monoxide detector went into alarm. If you think that the only headache you have when you're working in a mechanical room is because the job's a pain in the butt, that may not be it. Please protect your people from carbon monoxide. And also, I think as professionals, we have an obligation to inform the people that they have a problem and to help them resolve that problem. If you want to see how bad this really is, Google carbon monoxide deaths. I actually, when I was building my class up for carbon monoxide training for the Green Mechanical Council, I was on the Yahoo notification. I don't know if you ever use that, but you can put in a subject and anytime a news article or anything comes up, they will info mail you uh, through your email and tell you about it. I actually had to turn the damn thing off. I was getting flooded every day with brand new deaths from carbon monoxide. If there's anything that you take home, please carry one of those personal protectors. They're not that expensive. Volatile organic compounds. This is all the rage. Indoor air quality, right? You know what I call this? The new car smell. Mostly it comes from carpeting and paint. Okay? But it, it, if you hear about VOCs, that's what they're talking about. Okay? Sick building syndrome. Remember what we said about negative pressurization? Not enough air exchanges? Sick building syndrome really is, is hard to detect, but people are becoming more aware of it. But generally speaking, it comes from not enough fresh air. Okay, speak to me. Okay, waste. Okay, the waste stream is not just black water, although that's what it's identified with originally. The waste stream is, starts with when you go to the grocery store, in a good example, is when they ask you for paper or plastic. And you make that decision, you have decided what direction you're going to go with your personal waste stream. Okay? Can you interrupt a waste stream? Oh, sure you can. You look at it for your own business and you say, what's the fat we can cut? And that's looking for op waste opportunity, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, is stormwater considered waste stream? Right now it is. The city of Nina, Wisconsin, just uh, some years ago built a new uh, waste, waste uh, treatment plant. Under normal circumstances, they're at 40% capacity. When they have a thunderstorm, they go to 120% capacity. Let's think about this. Do we have an opportunity to interrupt the waste stream? Because isn't stormwater entering the waste treatment plant uh, 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 an interruptible waste stream? In my opinion, yes. OK. Waste opportunity. And. Um, this one's a good one. There was a company that had five jobs that they were going to have to cut in order to make the budget. So they brought in the employees and they said, OK, five of you are going to have to go because we can't afford to pay you, or you guys got to find a way to make this amount of money. This is what their wages and their benefits are. This is the number that we have to reach. Do you know how they did? By looking at waste opportunity. Do you think this cat? considered the throwing away fish as a waste opportunity? Absolutely. So it's a simple thing. 